Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 709th meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm John Williams. I'm the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and I'm the club's chair. So the Economic Club of New York is recognized as the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for discussions on economic, social, and political issues. More than 1,000 prominent guest speakers have appeared before the club over the past century, and we've established a strong tradition of excellence. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the students who are joining us virtually today, including those from Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business, Mercy College, Georgetown University, Harvard Kennedy School, and the Columbia Business School. I'd also like to welcome our 2023 class of fellows, both online and those in the room. They're a select group of diverse next generation business thought leaders, and they represent our largest class ever. So now I'm honored to welcome our special guest, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Kissinger was born in Germany on May 27th, 1923. That's four days shy of 100 years ago. And, and he's had uh, truly led a remarkable life, as we all know. He's perhaps best known for his work in shaping international relations while serving as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State under President Richard Nixon. But, and Dr. Kissinger has won many honors. He's received the Bronze Star from the U.S. Army, the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Medal of Liberty, the Department of, the Department of Defense Distinguished Public Service Award. And in 2020, he received the Economic Club of New York's Award for Leadership Excellence. He's a prolific author. He's written, over, written 20 books and numerous articles in U.S. foreign policy, international affairs, diplomatic history, and artificial intelligence. Dr. Kissinger holds undergraduate master's and PhD degrees from Harvard University. Uh, in addition, he was a member of the faculty of Harvard in both the Department of Government and, and the Center for International Affairs, and was the director of the Harvard International Seminar. These are, of course, just a few of his many, many accomplishments. Now, in just four days, Dr. Kissinger will achieve a milestone that many of us can only hope for, his 100th birthday, which we will celebrate a little later in the program. So today's discussion will be in the form of a fireside chat. We're delighted to have Marie Jose Kravitz, uh, the Chair Emerita of the Economic Club in New York, and the Chair of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, serving as our moderator. So as a reminder, this conversation is on the record. We have uh, media in the room uh, and online. So Marie Jose, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Henry, for being here. I know that you've been heavily solicited, especially in this uh, centennial year. So, somebody say the microphone's not working? Oh, good now? No? Is it working now? Yeah. Right. So, um, John William has talked a lot about your achievements and your accomplishments, but I'd like to start a little earlier than that, and uh, just for a few minutes, we'll get to the issues. But talk about your first impressions when you came to the U.S. as a young teenager. You had to give up your soccer, your football team in, uh, in Germany and on all of your habits and friends and so on, and left uh, under duress with your family. And what was your first impression of the U.S. when you first, very first arrived? I arrived, actually, it was Labor Day of 1938, was September 5th, I, uh, and uh, we left, had left Germany two weeks earlier and visited a relative in London for two weeks and then came here. So... The first impression was of a uh, of tremendous vitality of uh, people in the streets. I knew so. I thought the fire escapes and buildings were balconies, and, uh, 
So I, uh, but the uh, the impression was uh, the major impact. I went to high school for a year, uh, and uh, I read read an essay of how I felt, and I wrote in that essay. Uh, I miss many of the people I grew up with, uh, but uh, then I think that here in America, I can walk along the streets with my head erect because in Germany I was part of a discriminated minority. And there were signs at every public building that Jews were not welcome here. And uh, so the liberation of the human re relationship was for me the greatest experience. And also the fact that there was no discrimination whatsoever that I felt towards an immigrant with an act. Well, I didn't even speak English when I came here. Uh, so I've developed a kind of patriotism that... Uh, it's resentful of attitudes that base politics and policies on the failures of the American society because my personal experience was the opposite all the way through. Then, of course, you fought for that freedom. Uh, John Williams mentioned your Bronze Star, but Sergeant Kissinger was the rifleman. And then you were in counterintelligence. You witnessed the liberation of the labor slash concentration camp in, in Olive. And the war ended and you didn't come home. You stayed till 1947. And you wrote to your parents, and I'm going to quote, that you wanted to do it in our own little way something to make all the previous sacrifices meaningful. It's very touching for a young man at that time to really think about a cause that, would be, that was bigger than yourself. Well, before counterintelligence, I was in the infantry with the 84th Infantry Division that came from of northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. And so uh, and only after our forces entered Germany was I assigned to counterintelligence. Uh, and of course it meant I was coming back to the country that had discriminated in a governing capacity. And so I had to reflect about how to execute it. And participated in a policy of reconciliation because I thought these patterns should be reversed, not uh, the opposite. But while I was in the in the army, this is a point. I, I, I had become quite self-conscious about my accent before it became a trademark. <laughs> And while I was with the infantry division, uh, 
Nobody ever mentioned my accent. So I thought I had lost it. <laughs> but, but going to Harvard soon cured me of that illusion. <laughs> That's when I was, when people reminded me. But I have to say, Harvard was wonderful to me as a possibility of developing and becoming, it was basically a second immigration for me coming out of the army. I stayed one year at the European and intelligence school as a civilian. And then uh, Harvard admitted me and taught me some of my uh, intellectual potential. And it was a most significant experience in my life, even if my politics and Harvard politics have separated since then. But, but, but fact, I would say not Harvard politics, but academic politics, because other universities go further than Harvard in their views. But in fact, you refer to that in your book, The White House Years, and here you are um, brought into the administration by President Nixon. And you mentioned the fact that as you go into public life, that high office really consumes intellectual capital. It doesn't create it. And how important it is when one assumes office to have that stock of intellectual capital. And I wonder if you might comment on that and comment on leaders today and whether the intellectual, the stock of intellectual capital measures up to what you think is required? Well, first, I want to note, in, when, I, when Richard Nixon appointed me as his security advisor, I had never met him. Uh, and I had spent uh, many years, about 15 years, as a advisor and in time close friend of Nelson Rockefeller and uh, and Nixon appointed me uh, on, uh, totally unexpectedly and he did it he never wanted, he was afraid of being rejected. So when he offered me the position, he did it in a way that I didn't recognize that he had done it. So he had to call me back a second time. And I have a lot of eager students that ask me, how, how do you get into this position? And my advice is always never aim at the position, do what is most important. Well, anyway, when he offered it the second time, I said, I cannot just accept it. I have to talk to Nelson Rockefeller. With 99 out of 100 people that interview you, he would have told, they would have told you, I'll relieve you of this problem. You don't need it. But then I went to Nelson Rockefeller said, do you, really, do you, you have to, when I asked him, he said, you have to consider that he's taking a much greater chance on you than you are taking on him. And therefore you have an obligation to accept it. 
And so this is how that relationship uh, formed. And once you are in that high office, uh, I think the security advisor today is the most important element in an administration in the forming of foreign policy, policy with the president. Because every foreign policy and national security issue goes through its office. And it's an interesting psychological problem. The cabinet members are 10 minutes away. The security advisor is 30 seconds away from the Oval Office. And in almost every administration, in foreign policy, the most sensitive tasks are given to the security advisor and not to the Secretary of State. That's inherent. And so also there's inherent a kind of tension. It hasn't been visible in this administration, but it's been true of many administrations between the Secretary of State and the security advisor. But then you, be, you then be, came to a position where you held both positions. You were national security advisor. Yeah, I had both. Secretary of State. I had both positions. I was also. Was a, there a, tension? Was there tension? <laughs> it was. Uh, I then. Uh, <clears throat> the State Department is a. An absolutely unique institution. It has its people who dedicate their service, their life to service to the country and then up, operate abroad. So they basically uh, think that the Secretary of State uh, or the President couldn't have passed the foreign service exam. So they, uh, there is to impose a, a policy on them that they have not generated is a task for any uh, person coming in. But then it's the nature of these positions of the president, the secretary of state, all these topics, that so many problems present themselves every day that you don't have the opportunity to reflect creatively about where you are going. And I had the benefit, first, of that the president the president I served knew an enormous amount about foreign policy from his own trap. And I had studied the making of peace in the Napoleon at the end of the Napoleonic War that led to a century of relative tranquility in Europe. So, in those positions, you consume capital. You don't create it. You learn how to manage the bureaucracy. You don't learn to ask where you should be going. So, if you don't get into this position with some substantial background, either academic or practical, that has caused you to reflect about the purpose of actions. It, there's always the danger that you get consumed by tactics. And one, and that is, uh, I know, saying, 
favorable things about Richard Nixon. It's not what you frequently hear from this place. But I started having supported Nelson Rockefeller, who's clo who remained my close friend through this whole period. Uh, but the great strength of Nixon was that he had formed opinions about the nature of international strategy and tried to conduct policy. And that's how what I also believe. So it developed into a series of policies which I'm not here to defend one way or the other, but try to explain what my basic view of strategy and foreign policy is, that, that America has to adapt its purposes to the feasible with a long-range view in every administration, and that is the biggest task of every administration. And what did you say? Invented this subject. And it was not that I asked her to. It's quite, but I'm happy that she did. Because that's important to understand some of our current debates and some of the issues as they develop. And that's the, where I come from, basically, from my experience of this country as an immigrant and from the vision of America that developed through the observation and living through intense crises in the world, in which, in my view, America is the key their solution. So take us back to one of those very important strategic decisions and the opening up to China and your first encounters with the Chinese leadership and how that shaped the China-US relationship. And with that context, we can talk a little later about the current relationship. But take us back to your first encounters and the framework for pursuing that strategy? Well, the relationship with China, today, the, some people occasionally say, why did you open up to China altogether and thereby create a problem? But the problem of China at that time was present. It was the most revolutionary country in the world. It encouraged upheavals everywhere. It was, in a way, a key to the Vietnam War because its supply routes and its supplies, together with the Soviet Union, enabled the Vietnamese to keep that that war going. And so uh, we were determined from the beginning uh, to see whether a contract with the Chinese could be established. It reached the point where it the Gold's funeral in Paris, there was a reception by the French president, 
of all the visiting dignitaries. And Nixon said to me, when you see the Chinese ambassador, walk up to him and say, we want to have communicate with them. Well, that would have been a sensation if that had been done because there were so many people there and he never stood alone for long enough for me to do that. But we then instructed the ambassador in Warsaw who uh, the, ambas the American ambassador in Warsaw and the Chinese ambassador in Warsaw had been designated by the Geneva Agreement of 54 as contact points for negotiations about Taiwan. And they had had 162 meetings when we came into office. And they all ended the first day with the Chinese demanding the return of Taiwan and the Americans demanding that the Chinese agree to a peaceful pursuit of that objective. And that ended the conversation. There was nothing else for 25 years. And uh, so we had instructed our ambassador in Warsaw at the next social location where the Vietnam, where the Chinese were present, to walk up to them and say, America wants a serious dialogue. And then we got a message back uh, that they were ready to discuss the turnover of Taiwan. And we replied, we will talk only about all the problems. And out of this, I won't go through all this, emerged uh, Nixon's decision to send me as his representative to China. Uh, I had not, I had been dealing with the Soviet Union leader and representatives until then. And the Soviet, and this was during the days of the Berlin ultimatum, and the Soviet negotiating tactic, maybe partly because of the insecurity, is to begin with excessive demands coupled with some sort of military pressure. So, uh, the Chinese approach was quite different. What had happened, which I didn't know, but prior to my visit, uh, Mao decided China was encircled and therefore needed to open up. At that moment, there were 42 Soviet divisions at the northern border of China and that had been placed there within a recent period. And he had moved, he had freed four uh, uh, muscles that had been purged and humiliated out of their positions in concentration camps and asked them to write a strategy for where they were, which showed that the national feeling of China often and most of the time transcends even political uh, difficulties and nightmares. And they, decided, and they recommended opening to the United States. So that's what they did, but they did it in a, uh, at least they did it the way Zhou Enlai, who was prime minister at the time, 
there was an opening session in which I was prepared for a series of demands. And I had a list of our demands with me, which we had generated before. But he began the discussion. Uh, I, I had an opening statement which said somewhere I thought was very eloquent. Uh, so now we find ourselves in a land of mystery to us. That's mysterious to us. And John Lyell, David Sand, that said, what's so mysterious about China? There's over a billion of us and we don't feel mysterious to each other. So maybe we should make it a task to learn not to be mysterious towards each other as countries. And then we can make progress. And actually, my first visit to China, uh, of which the main result was that it invited Nixon to China, uh, did not discuss the grievances. It discussed the international situation as if we were two college professors. Uh, uh, it's publicly available now. Uh, and so, ever since in my approach to China and my interpretation of China, my impression is they always aim at first for a conceptual agreement of answering the question, what are we trying to do? We might not agree on that, often don't, but that creates a framework from which you can then go to the concrete issues. And I think in the current situation, it is, in my opinion, more useful when the top leaders meet to concentrate on the essentials of what the purpose of the meeting is rather than trying to fix some practical problem until that pra unless of course it can be that a problem is in itself very practical and needs to uh, a very general and taiwan is in a unique position in that respect and in fact mao did talk to you about taiwan well the Evolution of that is important because I think it has some relevance to the current situation. Uh, when after my after the secret visit, I made another visit to China to prepare the communique that Mao and Nixon were going to. That was over, it was nearly three months. No, it was three months before Nixon would get there because we thought that if Nixon and Mao deadlocked and Nixon was in China at that point, that would be a very difficult situation. And so we try to work out the communique in its outlines ahead of time. And uh, so we came up with an outline that was somewhat unprecedented in the sense usually communicates at the end of these meetings, as you can read in the newspapers every day, have a list of agreements and of general consensus. In this agreement, in this uh, communique, each side lists its own position, 
separately and often differently from the other, but it's part of a common communique. And uh, so that gave us a chance in a communique to state our position on Taiwan fully. And we stated it as opposition to any military use, uh, to any uh, military attempt to take over Taiwan. But we also put into that communique a general statement of one China, which was not, which was expressed as that the Chinese people have asserted a belief in one China. The United States does not contest or challenge that proposition. We didn't choose between Taiwan and Beijing. We just stated that as a general. So this became part of the communique before Nixon met Mao. And then when Nixon and Mao finally met, uh, Mao pretended that he, any concrete issue that came up, Mao said, I'm a philosopher, I don't deal with issues like this. Uh, let Kissinger and Joe and I deal with that. But when it came to Taiwan, he had a concrete position. And he said, there are a bunch of revolu counter-revolutionaries. We don't need them. For a long hundred years, uh, and other phrases that said, "We will ask for them someday." He said, but he made it clear that this was not now, and therefore this created the framework that then was elaborated in the Nixon administration and continued in every other administration until very recently of an autonomous Taiwan that would not be sovereign and would not be challenged but under it, Taiwan developed into what it is today, a thriving, democratic institution, whatever label you want to give it. And that is what's the key issue now. So when we we keep saying we believe in a one China solution, but we act as if we are wanting to create a two China solution or an independent Taiwan. So that is a nuance on which the man is dependent. But under that old system, Taiwan could receive military aid. So we it was not part of our policy to abandon Taiwan, and it has gone on for over 50 years with, without direct challenge. And of course, Mao also said, someday we'll ask for it. But that's exactly it, Henry. We're <clears throat> 50 years or halfway through his 100 years. There's now a war in Ukraine. Um, the 
chessboard has changed somewhat um, with Russia and China somewhat closer than certainly you had wished. You had hoped that the U.S. could be, and you've said it many times, closer to the Soviet Union and closer to China than the two of them would be with, with each other. It's a different situation, or do you think that um, well, on it the, isn't? Yes, the situation is quite different. Uh, China has become uh, stronger than anybody anticipated, and that is a reality in, in itself. Uh, I was not in government when the major decisions on the economic recovery uh, were taken. Uh, but nobody, I remember, sending or there was a group of very senior CEOs who went to China in around 75. Uh, no, it was set after I left government. And they came back and said the situation for economic development was hopeless because uh, the economy was used to promote employment for its own sake without any direction of where the economy is all to. Well, anyway, it turned out to be totally wrong. And over 20 years, the Chinese developed a military capacity, uh, and above all, an industrial capacity that made them one of the great economic power, the second economic power in, in, in the world. When you discuss, when you conduct foreign policy geopolitically, as I believe it should be, one has to gear it, one has to understand another country's capacity, and therefore the basis of the relationship was bound to change when China became an intense economic competitor. When we opened to China, China ranked below Honduras in terms of foreign trade with the United States. Uh, 20 years later, it had developed the capacities that we now are aware of. And so now the issue is, is this a strategic issue or an ideological issue or both? Some people think or act as if it were a purely ideological issue that can only be ended by the transformation of the Chinese system. Uh, I leave that question open. If the day-to-day -day conduct of policy is aimed at the transformation of the system, that means that we are in a state of permanent confrontation. And as technology grows, and is acquired by both sides, and as the essence of the new technology is, that geography no longer protects, because distance no longer matters. And that difficulty of identifying targets disappears because every target is 100% vulnerable. And when you add to it all the cyber and other, then 
a conflict militarily between the two sides takes on another dimension. And so my view is we need to be always strong enough to resist any pressures. And we must always be ready to defend what we define as our net vital interests. But we must also be clear what our net vital interests are and to stay within those bounds and then to see whether on other issues like the development of technology, like climate, like issues that affect us all, we can come to some understanding that reduce the dangers of a war that happens because we can't control the exuberance of tactical people. Uh, and I always urge people to read about the outbreak of World War I, the, read about July 1914, where no country intended to go to war, but dragged itself into a war that killed over 20 million people. Uh, and which they then couldn't settle. There were some discussions in 1916. And the leading countries at that point had decided they wanted peace without victory. But they had already lost over a million and a half people. And they didn't know how they could go back. So they had to come to America to help solve it. But we were, it took us a while to get ready, even to think of it, and then another while to do it. And so in the end, these huge casualties occurred. But that was nothing compared to what a major high-tech war is today. So, my views are always, we absolutely have to defend our vital interests. And we must stand by the countries that have cooperated with us. But we must see what possibilities might exist in the direction that I have sketched. And that takes two, and it requires for China to adopt a similar attitude. And that's the key issue now. So, Henry, we could go on about China, but we have only a few minutes left, and I'd like you to comment on Ukraine. And you mentioned, in fact, possibilities, uh, discussions, dialogue, well, Is that in your framework for Ukraine? Well, with Ukraine, I strongly favored the creation of an independent Ukraine at the end of the uh, of the nineteen eighty period. And I thought it was essential to have an independent Ukraine. And therefore, I favor the defense of Ukraine. And I, I strongly support the administration policy to this point. I think now we are at a point where we have achieved our strategic objective in the sense 
that the attempt, the, the military attempt of Russia to absorb Ukraine has failed. And now we are in a phase where the lines between the countries will have to be drawn. And one has to remember that the Ukraine that was within the Soviet Union was a creation in part of Stalin, who put a lot of Russian-speaking parts into uh, Ukraine. Well, I agree also that Russia should not make any gains as a result of military, as a result of military action. Uh, but I also think, and I have said so publicly, that the time has come to begin talks about a ceasefire, uh, preferably maybe after the offensive that is now planned. And, it, and it, I have not agreed that there is no communication with Russia whatsoever in, in this period, because Ukraine will be the most heavily armed country in Europe as a result largely of American action, which I strongly support. Uh, and uh, I think, therefore, and I'm assuming that Russia will be obliged either as a result of the immediate military action or as a result of the diplomacy that develops out of it to return, to give up uh, the essence of the conquests they have now made. But then but I am also thinking that the Russia that has existed now for 600 years has been an element at key periods of equilibrium against Sweden, against France, against Germany, and now when the issue has become global, uh, the center of Asia has been partly stab stabilized by the existence of an autonomous Russia. So, I w we should have an outcome which we have practically reached of a strong, independent, autonomous uh, Ukraine. And now I am in this strange position in when the proposal to include NATO in Ukraine into NATO was first made. I opposed it on the ground that I thought the better strategy was to build Ukraine into a bridge between Russia and the West and not an outpost for either tempting conflict. That policy was not carried out and contributed to the war.
but nothing excuses the scale with which Russia had conducted the war and the methods that they used. But so now that we are at this point, I believe that at the end of the successful war, Ukraine should be a member of NATO to protect it against Russian attacks and to restrain or constrain its own temptations for further aggression to its territory. And I think this is a stable outcome than the outcome about which I read so much of keeping it totally neutral and pour enough arms into it that it can defend itself by itself. I support the support we've given it, but it I rather have it part of an international system than by uh, than as a separate component. So that is going to be a big debate. And strangely, the countries who came together in defending Ukraine when it was attacked don't seem to want to undertake a commitment to defend Ukraine in peace, which seems to me easier to carry out than, but that it's going to be a key issue. And it, in, in the future, with the current strategy, I think it has to take its course through this offensive. But I don't want to get into that. Uh, and, and we've run and we've run out of time and it is your birthday <laughs> and we do want to wish you a very happy healthy birthday and hope that we can continue to benefit from your insights and your visits to the economic club because we always learn so much and you always broaden our perspectives so henry thank you for being with us and thank you, thank you. <laughs>